All right, our fifth and final chapter in the book of James. Um, <clears throat> you know, James has been kind of hard on us, and James has been very, uh, very strong in um, a lot of his admonitions, um, his corrections. I have said a few times that this feels like a very Lenten book. Um, you know, as we are considering a time of spiritual discipline, as we are considering the the need for repentance, uh, Lent itself can feel like a dour time. And I'm not saying there, there's nothing wrong with being dour at times. If, if anything, we need those periodic opportunities for very sober reflection. Um, and by having a season of the year that not only encourages the spiritual discipline part, but the self-examination uh, coupled with confession and repentance. Uh, again, something that can be done at any time, but like a lot of things that can be done at any time, that means it, it happens at no time. So setting aside this regular occurrence where we, not just do it individually, but corporately. There's a there's an encouragement. There's an accountability with one another when we hit Lent uh, for these things. That even that part of the prayer book that I keep in the in the in the bulletin about the invitation to a holy Lent. It says uh, that, that this need for uh, repentance that all Christians from time to time um, you know need to do. But when we know we get to let, there's this kind of uh, kind of an encouraging atmosphere for us to all do it, nice. to make sure that we're, you know, taking the opportunity. Uh, again, we could take this opportunity in November or July, but I think there's something to be said, if only for our likelihood of follow through that we do something at a regularly occurring time and we do it together. And so that's kind of how I feel you know, this book is as well. There's nothing about this book that we couldn't wrestle with at any time of the year and it'd be perfectly appropriate. It feels very Lenten to me as we are examining our own lives. Um, I'm the first person to cut myself a break, but sometimes I shouldn't. Um, sometimes I am my hardest critic, and sometimes I should be. Um, not so. I'm not encouraging us to, to all have bad opinions of ourselves. This is more along the lines of how much of our faith is openly public, and how much of it are only we aware of. Um, from the outside, are we presenting what's inside? And other than God, we're the only ones who have a good chance of trying to figure that out, for good or for bad. Um, I don't know what's in your head and you don't know what's in mine. I try to be the sort of person who says what he means and means what he says. But number one, I'm not always honest with myself. And number two, I could be trying to pull a fast one on you. And how would you know? So the book of James, I think, comes across like a ton of bricks at times because sometimes we need a ton of bricks. Uh, the pendulum needs to swing. Uh, I will say that there's nothing in James that I think is, is uh, wrongly harsh so much as it is a, um, a nice counterbalance to what I think is a predominantly message of grace and refreshment that um, I think the contemporary church has swung to uh, a more self-actualizing, um, I'm not gonna say self-gratifying because that sounds almost more crass than I intend, but you know, there are, like we did church history before, there's times where the, the pendulum swings in one way or the other. And 
I think that the contemporary church message, and I don't mean our church, I mean like just the church as a whole, you know, especially in, you know, America right now, but I, I, I have a feeling that it's like this in a lot of places. It is very much of the, the gracious love of God to you. That is a great message and it's 100% true and I fully support it. But if that's the only message that you get, you maybe lose the other element of the fullness of what that love means, the demands that that love ought to have on our lives, how it changes us. Um, this is the this is part of the holy mystery, kind of like as as Paul is relating to the, the holy matrimony as being being an image of of Christ as the bridegroom and the and the, and the church as his bride. This is a truism of life. Love changes you. Your love to the outside changes you and love that you receive changes you. Um, we, we joke that old married couples start to look like each other. No, he's... <laughs> <laughs> he says as... Uh, both gores are kind of sitting in the exact same manner, wearing the exact same shirt. <laughs> um, anyway, but that that ought to have, like, if you think about it, you know, the longer you spend with someone, you can't help but be influenced by them and you influence them. And and it's like, you know, you you wear each other in the same spots and it, and it just kind of kind of works together. So I'm going off on a little bit of a tangent here, but 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 with the point of trying to help us prepare for the summation of James, that the gracious love of God, that love that is of unmerited and undeserved favor and, and care, <clears throat> love changes you. Everything from having a child to getting married to having a dog. When you have, you know, if you've never had an animal and you get one and now you have this little creature that looks at you in that certain way, and they kind of depend on you or they follow you around or whatever it is, it can't help but change you a little bit. You start looking out for them. You start thinking about someone other than yourself. You start accounting for them in your plans. That's changing you. You're a slightly different person, maybe even a significantly different person because love changes us. When we love something, that vulnerability, that act of sacrifice or care, that changes us. But when we receive love, um, I'm not saying that uh, misbehaving children should never be corrected, but I have seen, and maybe you have too, some kid, just a little one, like act really horribly, have some kind of meltdown and just be just really miserable and get transformed by someone hugging them. Like whether they're overtired or they're scared or they just kind of got, everything got away from them, but they're so little they can't self-regulate. And rather than being sent to time out or spanked or whatever, like just holding them sometimes, they just, I've done this and they just kind of melt in your arms. And it's like, it's gonna be okay. And sometimes the yelling and screaming turns into tears. Love is changing that child. And there are times where uh, I think we can feel like the, the little child who has sort of gotten past themselves or can't, can't self-regulate or is out of control. And the love of God that can hold us tight can change us too. So if the contemporary church is preaching almost exclusively you know, God loves you, God loves you, God loves you. Well, there is an implication to that. That implication is, I think, less explored, less considered today. I'm not saying nobody does it or it never happens, but James is more of the, the consequence of that love on us. What, what changes should that love make? If you have been loved so thoroughly, sacrificially, fully, eternally, uh, how has that love changed us and how does it keep changing us? What are the effects it has on the way that we 
act and speak and order our lives. And a lot of the correction that comes down on James is really just reminding us what we should already know. And are you doing what you should already be doing? The love of God has changed you. Shouldn't it result in such and such? But aren't you doing this and that instead? And that's what I get a lot of his hardness from. Um, we treat somebody making a mistake differently when they're ignorant than we do when we're positive that they know better. Ignorant is not a pejorative, at least it doesn't have to be. Ignorance just simply means a lack of knowledge. And so to some degree, if somebody's doing the wrong thing, but they just have no idea, you correct them in a particular way to, oh, you don't know that if you, you know, if you don't jiggle the knob when you close the door, it's just going to open again. There's no way for you to know that, but I know that, you know, if you drive my truck, I know all the quirks and you don't. So let me, you know, when you hear this noise or you feel this rattle or whatever, don't, don't worry about it. Um, but when somebody knows to do something and they do the opposite, we tend to correct differently. We get more frustrated or we come down a little harder, or instead of saying, oh, well, when such and such happens, this is what you do. It's more like, hey, you know better, don't you? Kind of like that, uh, that section, was it, was it chapter two or was it chapter three about the tongue? And, you know, do you kiss your mother with that mouth? Do you praise God with that mouth? Did you just hear what came out of it? Is that the same mouth? that you use on a Sunday morning to recite the creeds. Really? Don't you think that's a little incongruous? So here we are. Let's wrap it up. As God has indeed loved us, for God so loved the world, what sort of changes should it have had in our life? What sort of changes will it continue to have? And how should we be showing them? Because honestly, we ought to know better. Chapter five. Now listen, you rich people, weep and wail because of the misery that is coming on you. Your wealth has rotted and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, the wages you failed to pay the workers who mowed your fields are crying against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the innocent one who was not opposing you. Kapow. He comes out swinging. All right. So this has come out hard and heavy. What is he saying? Well, I think he's talking about greed and um, perhaps accumulating in the sake of individualism, self-serving as opposed to trying to understand that you collected all the stuff and now you just hoard it and it's gone to waste. It's rotted. It could have been shared and right. it's been put to better use. Right. And you, and you, by, you know, I think by implication here, you've taken it sort of wrongly like part of that wealth that you hoarded you actually owed somebody else and you refused to give it to them um which just makes it worse it's bad enough that um you're the kid in the corner of the nursery who has the pile of toys but is doing this to them and saying no they're mine no but it if you realize that that kid went around the room and started snatching toys away from everybody else in order to make that pile, it makes the pile kind of even worse. So um, we ought to we ought to feel twitchy, every one of us, whenever uh, scripture points out the rich. Um, every one of us possesses a wealth that King Herod could not have imagined. Um, you know, those of us 
who feel like we are hard pressed in the current economic climate, you know, still have a standard of living that would make someone from the 1800s uh, utterly confused. So, probably parts of this world. Parts of this world right now, our standard of living is so substantially higher. Though the, the poverty line in America would be in the upper quartile in some other nations. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's all relative. Uh, so I I say it's one of those things, you know, whenever, whenever scripture hits it, hey, you rich, I think regardless of who we are, we need to take a little bit of self-identity there. Um, if only for a who, me, you know, the, the, the condemnation of, of the rich in a passage like this, we might be a part of, and we might not be a part of, I say better safe than sorry. Assume you're a part of this until you realize you're not. Better to err on the side of who me than to say no way. This has nothing to do with me. I'm not even going to listen. I'm not even going to pay attention because this couldn't possibly mean me. You know, then we wind up in a position of uh, uh, King David hearing the story from the prophet Nathan about about the man who the rich man who stole the the, the, the poor man's lamb just to just to feed his friends for a feast. And King David, oh, that horrible, horrible. Oh, he should be murdered and killed for such a terrible, like, yeah, that man's you. Oh, you know. So, um, but I think Meg's right on in if there is a condemnation of, 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 of the rich, then I think that condemnation is connected to a, how they got it, and B, what they did with it. I think it was um, John Wesley of Methodism who said something along the lines of, uh, I want Christians to be as successful as possible, to earn as much as possible, to be as wealthy as possible, so they can give away as much as possible. Um, and that's a very different perspective than assuming that wealth or success is inherently wrong or bad. Yep. Um, so I'm not sure the rich are in so much trouble here if they paid the wages they said they were going to pay. I'm thinking that maybe the rich aren't in so much trouble here if they didn't hoard and squander what they had, but instead gave it away to those in need or reinvested it in ways that would bless others, you know, use what you have for someone other than yourself. And yet it's still a reminder whether we consider ourselves financially well off or not, that all the things of this world that we might accumulate, not a bit of those material goods will last forever. Can't take it with you. And, 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 and even if you could and fill your pyramid with them, by the time the archaeologist digs it up, it's going to crumble into dust. Well, also, when you were talking about Accumulating and taking from someone else. We're not just talking about people, but everything's on loan from God. And so we're for taking and accumulating and squandering. We're doing that to God, not just other people. So it goes next level with that. Well, and, and this is uh, that's that's an excellent point. And I want to even expand it further to say, um, so my um my undergraduate degree is in business. It's, in, it's a business management. Um, and there are some elements that have were very, very helpful, I think, for me in kind of formulating some perspective, even on ministry. And one of the things is what is an asset and what are your resources? Um, when we consider, say, this place, the church, our church, um, we are stewards of what God has given us. Okay, well, what has God given us? 
we have money in the bank. Yep. There's a financial element to that. What else do we have? Well, we've got property. On that property, we have buildings. Those buildings can house activities and things and people. And we've got room for playgrounds and ball fields. And we've got a kitchen that can cook for people. And we have people. We have people who can do stuff, people who know things, people who know other people. We have people who can, who, you know, who know how to go help someone whose uh, uh, toilet is leaking. We have people who know how to help somebody file their taxes. We have people who know how to help someone who is uh, struggling in a marriage. We have people who know how to help children read. Um, our time, talent, and treasure are kind of an all-encompassing way of seeing what God has blessed us with and that we are ultimately stewards accountable to him of how we use it. So the rich can be rich in other resources rather than just the gold and the silver. Um, rich in time, rich in energy, uh, rich in ability, rich in knowledge, rich in relationship, rich in all these sort of various things. How do you use them? Do you squander them? Do you hoard them? Do you take from others or refuse others what they are rightly due? Um, and all of those things, I think, could be applied in a wider sense of uh, if this comes from God and it's just basically on loan for us to take good care of, are we doing it? Because that's been the, the perspective of the church here. All those things that I mentioned, we try to offer for the use and the blessing of others. The rooms, we are in constant use of groups from the community. The grounds, we have kids who come and play, not just with the groups who come here, but um, if you come like on a, on a weekday afternoon or on a Saturday, families will show up just to play in the playground. Um, our food cooks for the homeless and, for, and to make spaghetti for the community. Um, I mean, all, all these sort of things that you know, we could sit on, we could bury, or we could invest those talents, and there could be a return. So it uh, it's a it's a it's a it's a tough word, but I don't think it's a wrong word, and. The irony of the last couple of verses, you've lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fatted yourself on the day of slaughter in the sense of, you know, especially in an agrarian society, there were probably seasonal slaughter days. But um, how do you get an animal ready for slaughter? You want them as fat as possible because if, if they're a food source, you want them to be big and fat. And when you slaughter them, so you got more meat. But imagine, you know, doing it yourself. You know, nobody even had to give it to you. You went out and made a pig of yourself knowing that your turn was next. You condemned and murdered the innocent one who wasn't even opposing you. And that just seems, that's, that's a sharp one. All right. Verse 7, be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. You too be patient and stand firm, because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. What kind of patience do you think this is? He have it with us. Pardon? He says kind of patience. He's asking about that. He's having with us. Well, I mean, that's not what this passage is saying, but I think that's a fair point. You be patient, brothers and sisters, but who's patient if not God with us? 
he's very patient with us. And so again, if we apply it to ourselves, um, this, this is a, this come this come before. Um, I don't think anybody likes to be patient. And if you do, you're weird. Uh, maybe somebody likes it. I don't know. I can't imagine. But we like, if we want something, we kind of want it then. We don't want it later. And even if we're willing to wait, I think that that's always seen as, a, as something lesser. But what I like thinking about is the active, purposeful nature of patience. Patience feels kind of passive. Like, I guess I'm just supposed to sit around, huh? But when we are patient, it actually takes a matter of our will. There's sort of a, a choice and a purpose and an activity in it. And it's coupled here with stand firm. Being patient and standing firm actually requires, even if it doesn't look like movement from the outside looking in, there is something happening on the inside making a, a specific choice. Be patient, I'm being patient, I'm being patient. Um, and then standing firm, it just looks like you're just standing still, but standing still and standing firm are kind of two different things, aren't they? Mm -hmm. how, how, how would you distinguish the two? Standing still versus standing firm. Standing still is inert. Inert, yeah, I like that. It just means kind of nothing. But what, what what's the difference in with standing firm? Well, you have a you have a zeal and a, a, a way you want it to go, mm -hmm. and you're gonna you're gonna see it through. Yeah, you're gonna you're gonna see it through. There's a there's an element of perseverance. There's an element of strength to it. I, I like to think that when you say stand firm, it presupposes an external circumstance or force against you. If you stand still, you can just stand still for, you know, anywhere at any time. Stand firm, I, I kind of envision like you, you sort of lean forward and grit your teeth because oh, the wave is coming to hit you or the wind is starting to blow or something. To stand firm is almost like steadying yourself because it's, it's coming. Um, like the bees. Like the bees, they're coming. Um, so, what are we to be patient for? Patience is generally a good thing, but what? what? The coming of the Lord. A word from God, the coming of the Lord, that there is a culmination that we are looking forward to. This is the this is the return of Christ. This is the new creation. This is the redemption of the world. This is all, all this kind of stuff wrapped together. But um, do you find it easier to be patient for small things or big things? If I. I find it easier to be to be more patient for the bigger things because I sort of think they do take more time. It just yeah. makes more sense to me. The small things, it's like it's just a little thing. Right. What's, just, what, what's, what's the hold up? Exactly. Right? And I would say small things for me also seem like they're not consequential enough to be too patient. Like, like you said, what's the big deal? But the big things, um, like good things are worth waiting for, kind of a sense. Like if it's something super important. It's worth the wait. That's a phrase that we use, yeah. that something is worth the wait. Um, some things we say are not worth the wait because it turns out to be less good or special or or, or whatever. Um, Isn't quite what we were looking for. Yeah, I, uh, okay, I don't want to, I'm not, I don't want to call this place out because I haven't been, but I saw... Uh, some online advertising for a new business in town that I was very intrigued by their name and their pre and their um, prints. It was basically a, a a place for desserts. 
and it was going to open soon. And I'm like, ooh, you know, as soon as Lent is done, I might have to check you out. And then um, it's it's not been open for very long, and some reviews are starting to come in. And the reviews are a little mixed. And some are like, yeah, it's amazing. It's great. I love it. And some are like, eh, I mean, it's okay, but I guess my expectations were a little high. It was not worth the drive for that. My grandmother makes a better such and such. Um, and so I could see, like, really working it up in my mind. Oh, boy, here it comes, here it comes, here it comes. And you kind of really want it to be awesome at that point. And if it's not, if it's just okay, and I think about waiting and being patient and then driving over there, whatever, and then that's where you start getting frustrated. But if it really was good, if it was as good as you hoped it would be or better, how do you feel about the wait now? It was totally worth it. Totally worth it. So did you? Oh, I haven't yet. Still Lent. <laughs> um, talk to me in a couple of weeks. <laughs> um, so I think this is a reminder um, of what we're waiting for. It's not just patience as a virtue, period. That may be true, but it's saying in this case, your patience is worthwhile because of what it is you're waiting for. We're waiting for the coming of the Lord, the redemption of the world, the fulfillment of our hopes, the, the reconciliation of the pen. I mean, everything together, that's worth waiting for. It's not going to be a dud, and it's not a small thing. He even says, see how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop. It kind of goes out of his way to say that He's not being patient for something that's meh, but there is something really good in this harvest. And so to be patient, even through the, he says the autumn and the spring rains. So this really indicates something that's taken its sweet time. There's not even one calendar season. There's, there's multiple calendar seasons. There's at least three. Because if you're waiting for spring, and you're waiting for fall, what's in the middle of spring and fall? Summer, you didn't even mention it because it's not worth mentioning. It's like, you're gonna have to wait up through the whole thing or maybe through winter. You know, that's there's always gonna be three if, if those are the bookends. So um, you might have to wait for a while, but it's so worth it. The coming of the Lord will be so worth it. However, don't, Grumble. Why, if we're being encouraged about the value of the crop we're waiting for, why take the time to remind us not to grumble? <clears throat> I think we tend to grumble when it's something that we really want and it's taking its time. Oh, yes. Extending your patience, too. When your patience is tested. How do you tend to respond? Yeah. Eh. <laughs> um, I would like to say that, oh, well, under difficult circumstances, I redouble my efforts. Um, but uh, grumbling and complaining is so easy especially when what we're waiting for feels so far away. Um, it's divisive. You know, Charlie, you've been waiting so long. Why are you doing it? You know, and then you start. And maybe Charlie was fine, but now you've got it in his head. You're right. Man, it's still not here. Rah, rah, rah. Now you got two of them. You got two of them. Well, now we're all going to be into it at that point. Yeah. And now the, 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 the whole thing is kind of kind of changed because of that. Um, but also there's a, this is just kind of one of those aphorisms. Um, what is it? Uh, small people talk about other people and, uh, better people talk about ideas or eh, something like that. Whatever the phrase is, I forget, but, but the idea is grumbling, but also grumbling against another person. 
So it's it's not even just like this general frustration about uh, patience is so hard. It's more like patience is so hard and I'm tired of looking at Bruce. Because okay. he's just, I'm about up to here with the suspenders, <laughs> whatever. Um, so I will say, I think the risk is maybe higher when patience is a struggle that we take it out on other people. Um, when you have a stressful day, for instance, aren't you more likely to snap at someone who asks the innocent question? Um, if I'm already feeling the pressure of the patients, even if I'm waiting for something good, it's <laughs> almost like I just want that stress to come out. And what's a real easy way for that stress to come out? Pick on somebody. Just pick on because it it distracts me first of all because now i'm not thinking about this thing i'm waiting for i'm thinking about how i can pick at you or or how you know funny i can make it to myself or you know, whatever um you would do that with our children right you have a stressful day you come home and your kid the innocent one yeah that they're talking about it does not oppose you but just asking a simple question right you're like why are you asking me that? Can't you see I've just had a bad day? Or and then you're like, uh, uh, right. You know, you and know. you and now you've managed to share that bad day. Now everybody's having a bad day. We what was the chapter we talked about about misery loves company? And that is just a it's just a truism. Misery doesn't love company in the sense of misery loves in a genuine sense. Misery loves company because as long as I have to feel bad, you should feel bad too. I want I want to spoil everyone's day. Um Yet remember what we're being patient for, the coming of the Lord also comes with his judgment. It, 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 why for this thing you're waiting for, would you set yourself up for failure? Set yourself up for judgment because instead of being patient, you've blown off the stress and the steam by making someone else feel worse. Brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we count as blessed those who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Above all, my brothers and sisters, do not swear, not by heaven or by earth or by anything else. All you need to say is a simple yes or no. Otherwise, you will be condemned. Um. Eh, maybe I could have stopped at 11, but let's do 10, 11 first, because those kind of fit together. And then 12 kind of feels like a code at the end. Um, the patience of the prophets. What's What do you think he's alluding to? The patience of the prophets. What they were saying did not come immediately to pass. Okay. And so? And so? They would be thinking, maybe I heard one. Okay. So maybe you're going to turn back on what you said mm -hmm. because you're not getting an, a, a, the, the, the instant not, not, answer. No results. Right. What else um, would the prophets have to persevere about? Because I think it's related to what you said. It's like the next step from that. Because then what happens about the Job's case, he's still sick. What, what, about, the, what about the other people? Who, for instance, uh, um, not not Job in this regard. How let, let's go to um, let's go to Jonah. Preaches destruction on Nineveh, and Nineveh repents, mm -hmm. and Job gets really ticked off that God doesn't smite them. But what happens to the prophet in the, in a case sort of similar to Jonah? He's preaching. The judgment's coming, judgment is coming. And what if the Ninevites are like, I don't care. But then the judgment doesn't come immediately. What is what does Jonah do in that case? Do you keep preaching, even though the, now they're laughing at you, or now they're they're overtly ignoring you? Or do you run away? 
because I don't want to take the heat. Um, Elijah has to stand firm even when um, he is opposed by the king and the armies of Israel. You know, the king's in control. What happens when you're the person you're calling out is someone who could do you in? Or the prophets who were preaching things that people just didn't want to hear. Nobody wants to hear about you're doing bad and you need to be fixed. You, you were wicked and you need to repent. You have strayed. I don't like to think that I have strayed. Thank you very much. Well, and again, for a lot of these people, they were coming out of a different state, a different philosophical situation. So they're more, well, you're telling me I'm wicked, but that's not necessarily how I was raised, or that's not my tradition. I'm kind of, you're confusing me. And yeah. I don't agree with you. So sometimes we need patience with people who just, I think patience also means just kind of meeting people where they are, especially when you're talking earlier about ignorance. I think that takes a lot of patience when we're talking about where people are in their faith journeys. Um, when we think about Job, obviously we think of his sufferings and this, all the calamities of his family and of his stuff and than his own physical pain. And um, his friends who start off doing good, they just sit with him. But then eventually they start like, okay, enough's enough. And they start trying to preach to him. Um, but Job continually has this answer like, nope, I haven't done anything wrong and God is just. So he's going to fix this. It's going to work out. Somehow it's going to work out. Um, Near the end of Job, we have that interaction between God and Job, where, where God basically finally answers Job, like, okay, you want to ask me a bunch of questions, try it. But just understand, understand that you are, you know, you're basically asking questions you don't even understand how to ask, let alone the answer to your, your your finite perspective is asking for an infinite answer that you are not prepared to handle. Are you sure you want to go there? Um, and it, it ends with, with basically Job repenting of his frustration, but God restoring him. Go back way early on before he has any interaction with God, any kind of confrontation, or any kind of answer, and some of the most beautiful passages. Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will return. The Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away, blessed be the name of the Lord. Or, my favorite, I know that my Redeemer lives. The last who will stand upon the earth, and in my body I myself shall see God. I myself will see him who is my friend and not a stranger. You say that in the burial service. I love it. Mm -hmm. Job says those things early on. Yep. So those are basically prophetic words, words of, of godly truth. He's saying them to his friends, but he's also almost just kind of saying it to himself. We have chapters and chapters of his suffering to go before he actually gets an answer from God. There's your perseverance. He doesn't just persevere in the sense of he survives the agony, but even in the beginning of the agony, he makes these very, very strong statements of his faith. Stuff that we could understand him changing his mind if the suffering never ended. Um, oh yeah, that's a, that's, that's a good one too. Uh, <laughs> curse God and die. That's what the wife... That's what Job's wife tells Job. Um, this, it, 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 in a roundabout way, it, it reminds me of the words from that, that famous philosopher, Mike Tyson, who said, everybody's got a plan until you get punched in the face. Uh, he was asked about some boxer he was going to face, about, oh, well, this guy, he's got a plan. He's got a plan to defeat you. What do you think about that? And, and, and Iron Mike's response was, everybody's got a plan until they're punched in the face. 
<laughs> when reality hits you, your words might just change. So Job says all the right things while his suffering begins. What happens when it lingers with the threat that it might never end? Will he stand firm and be patient or will his patience run out? And Job, Job stands firm. There's a song we used to sing here. Hang in there, Job. Hang in there, Job. Oh, I don't know that one. Hang in there, Job. I don't know that one. Um, all right. So we now see the story of Job as one of this, you know, very humble perseverance through suffering. But remember, Job doesn't see the end while he's going through it. Um, Job only sees the suffering and has to persevere through the worst of it with no guarantee that it's going to end. And with those friends. And with those friends who keep pressuring him, would you just confess already? We know you've done something wrong. That's the, all the friends have basically the same point. God would, this is clearly punishment because it's so bad. And God wouldn't punish someone unless they deserved it. If you would just confess whatever it is that you did deserve this, he would have mercy. And Job's like, I didn't do anything. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, friends. They were better, they were better after sitting there with the United States. Right? They spent a whole week. They just sit there with him in his mourning. And, and you're like, yeah. And then they're like, okay, enough of that. Right. Yeah. But then again, how many times have I done that? Very understanding and compassionate until I've had enough. And then I'm going to give you what for. Because enough, enough's enough. Get up. All right. Um, the Lord is full of compassion and mercy. And, and that, that little section about patience and perseverance, I think, has a very worthwhile final point attached to it. That that perseverance and that patience in for nothing. But that God is full of compassion and mercy. Now, this last verse, verse 12, let's just handle that by itself. Don't swear, not by heaven or by earth or anything else. All you need is a yes or no, otherwise you'll be condemned. What is he saying here? This is not the only time about you will hear about you, you let your yes be your yes. Jesus himself. Mean, mean what you say. Jesus himself says, you know, don't swear by Jerusalem because that's God's throne. Don't swear by heaven, you know. So mean what you say, right? So there's there's a there's a simple message of clear integrity. Say what you mean and mean what you say. That should be enough. Have have have, have integrity. Then you don't have to swear. This is not swearing like 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 profanity. GDMF. -er. No, no, no. This is swearing like, no, no, I swear to you. By the beard of Odin, I did not take that cookie. Like you know, that's the sort of swearing we're talking about. You are invoking God's authority to try to convince someone else that what you're saying or promising is true. And that doesn't sound right. <laughs> right. And um, I'm not 100% sure why this is connected here the way that it is. It almost feels like an aside. Maybe it is. Or maybe this is in response to something. Because remember, a lot of these letters are a response to something happening. Um, and this might, there just might be a, a rash of people doing the, the, this, uh, the, the swearing stuff. Um, we, we will periodically get people who stop in out of nowhere asking for financial help and that's been every church probably experiences this on you know some occasion over the years and i've been doing this for a long time i am very willing to help people i am very happily credulous i'm i am content to be taken advantage of to some degree in a pastoral sense um somebody tells me this hard luck story and it's honestly not really true, but you know, by and large, whatever. 
we have some funds to help. We'll, we'll try that. Over the year, I'm not a dummy. I know people take advantage um, and I'm not naive. There's kind of a choice that you make like, yeah, but this, you know, sure. If I'm taking advantage of, but ultimately that's on you, not on me. You get used to a few tells because you see them so much. And this is the easiest one. The longer, more complicated, and more detailed the story, the less likely it is to be true. People who are in genuine, emergent need come, and it's just like, I, 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 oh, help. It, it stays very simple, very clear. It's usually, you know, something almost too big to express, and the details are a little on the sparse side because it's overwhelming. But it's the people who have, it's like this long narrative. Not only is it rehearsed, but there's just too much happening. There's just too much going on. You know, I, so that's a little bit like these, the, oh, I swear to you by the throne of God himself. That's like the person coming in off the street and telling the story about, you know, their disabled child who was in the car with their disabled grandmother with a car that only has two and a half wheels that she had to push from Tennessee in order to get, I mean, whatever. It, I mean, I've heard some really silly things. Um, your over-reliance on the saddest part of the story does not make it more believable it makes it less believable. You insisting and invoking heavenly authority does not make you look more trustworthy. It makes you look less trustworthy. Because now I, I'm assuming you're scamming. If you have to up and down about what a great Christian you are, uh, there's here's another aphorism. Um, anyone who has to tell you they're a good man is probably not a good man. <laughs> You know, if they have to insist on, on uh, you know, how much integrity they have, maybe they're trying to cover over their lack of integrity. I heard a lady in Panera the other day, she's, she started yelling about something that her friend was talking about. She's like, I try to be a good Christian. You know what? They are crossing the line. Right. But she kept emphasizing how Christian she was, but <laughs> she just couldn't. Right. During this very unchristian display. Right. Yeah, and it's very, and I think that she was talking about the person was, she just didn't agree with it. Yeah. And so she, she kept carrying on, I am a Christian, I swear I'm a Christian, but that, no, I'm not going to, yeah. So a yes, a simple yes and a no is not saying we should never say anything other than yes or no, but it is to say, if you will simply demonstrate your integrity, you don't need to add all this extra stuff to it, which frankly, we don't have a right to. Stop swearing by, you know, these heavenly, these heavenly things. Just be, be a good person who does the right thing. Um, God's throne is not ours to swear on anyway. And it's, it's very imposing, um, if not wholly inappropriate. We shouldn't dare to do such things. We trivialize God's nature, even his justice, when we try to use it in a manipulative fashion for our own sake. Is there anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Seems like you just changed the subject. <laughs> so, yeah, I agree with that. Um, I don't, I don't write a lot of notes by hand, like letters and notes by hand. 
but I do sometimes like, 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 like greeting card kind of things. I'm no good at it. And my handwriting is poor and I'm a little embarrassed, which is why I don't tend to do it by hand. But when I do do it by hand and I'm concentrating, I'm so out of practice with it. I'll write and I'll write and I'll write. And I'm really concentrating hard to make it readable because that's difficult for me because I'm very sloppy. And then all of a sudden I realize I'm super close to the bottom of the page. And there was like three things I wanted to say and I've only done one. And then I start writing really small and scribbling and it kind of gets way to the edge. And I throw a bunch of junk in right at the end because I was supposed to say it and I had forgotten to. And I want to suggest that sometimes these epistles feel like they've gotten to the edge of the papyrus. I'm like, oh, mm, I forgot to say such and such. And I'm just going to get it in real quick. So this is a summary and if there's anything that he wants us to know that has not been naturally incorporated, I think we're kind of getting it all at the end. Maybe I'm wrong, but this is not the only epistle that kind of no. that kind of throws in what feels a little disjointed. Mm -hmm. Like these are important points, but they yeah, they just sort of feel like a bullet bullet point list right at the end. Um, but what about this bullet point list? What is this bullet point list encouraging us to do? Pray for people. Pray mm -hmm. and pray for each other. There is this mutuality of prayer and service. And I think that's maybe the most significant yeah. part of it. You are a part of a congregation, of a church, of a body, and you ought to be working together. What's interesting is he doesn't just say pray for people. He's actually saying too, pay attention. Have you looked around? Is anyone suffering? Uh -huh. Are you cheerful? Yeah. It's it's that thing we talked about earlier, getting out of yourself. Oh yeah, that's good. Waking up and he's around. Yeah, that's really great because you can skip right over that part, I think, and talk about the practicalities. But what happens when you're not actually paying any attention to anybody else? You'll never, you'll never see it. Yeah. So we have this corporate interdependence as a congregation, as a body, as a church. We ought to be praying for each other. We ought to be paying attention to know how to pray for each other. We ought to be doing it. Um, our happiness and our sadness, our joy and our need should be shared and should work together. Uh, there's different responsibilities. The elders will do certain things, but basically you are in this not on your own. You're in this together. So, so work it out together and keep doing it on a regular basis. Um, all right. So especially when you know that there are other people actively and openly praying for you. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Um, it availeth much. Um, it is encouraging to know the, 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 the effectiveness of prayer, but I think it's also an encouragement that our personal holiness and righteousness, the sanctification, should make a difference as well. Um, again, I, this, is, this is an aside, but... If we are saying our prayers, if we are spending time in the word, if we are doing corporate worship, receiving the Eucharist, all these sort, sort, sorts of things, asking for the, the Holy Spirit to be working in our lives, shouldn't we be more righteous all the time? And I don't mean this, oh, you know, you're saying that we're depending on our works. And, no, I'm just saying, shouldn't we be growing in holiness as we say the spirit is sanctifying us. So the longer we do this, the more it happens and the more benefit there will be. That's, that's basically what I'm getting. Growth as a result of action. Yes. Growth, that's right. Growth as a result of action. That's how maturity happens. All right. Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain and it did not rain a land for three and a half years. Again, he prayed and the heavens gave rain. 
and the earth produced its crops. What in the world is he talking about? I love this story. Okay. Elijah stood up to the king, King Ahab. Right. And he said, you know, because you've strayed and you've led Israel astray and all this, you're causing all this problem and murder and everything else, the, you'll know the judgment of God because the rain's going to stop. Yeah. And, and the King Ahab was like, boys, get him. And so Elijah had to run and hide. And he hides in a cave. And the water, the rain stops. Yeah. But Elijah, terrified for his life, is hiding in a cave. Why does Elijah not die? Because... God sends ravens every day and they bring him food and he can drink by the stream that goes right by the, by the cave. And so that's in like first Kings or something. Um, all it says was the, 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 the drought lasted for so long that the stream dried up and then, um, but in first Kings, it doesn't say how long it just says that the stream dried up. And on the day that the ravens stopped coming, that's when the rains returned. Again, it's, a, it's sort of like a manna situation. But it's within the tradition, it's within the Midrash how long it was, but the actual story of 1 Kings never mentions the length of time. We get it here. Two and a half years, every single day, even if Elijah was getting worried, a raven showed up supernaturally to give him food, and you should be able to take the encouragement, God has not forgotten. And that should be the same thing in our lives too. There is some sort of little encouragement, even today, that God has given you, like a raven carrying food, God has not forgotten you. My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back, remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of their ways will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. It's a funny conclusion. Yeah. It doesn't really, it doesn't feel like it's kind of wrapping up with a big punctuated the end. But as practical as this letter is, what could be more practical than helping someone return to Christ? And maybe he doesn't feel like wrapping it up in a nice neat bow. Maybe he just wants to say, this stuff is hard and it's tough. And I know I have been strong on you and some won't make it. But I tell you what, those who are still hanging on and you see somebody who is at the risk of not making it, grab them, help them, bring them back because there is nothing better than that. What else? All right, well, that is the book of James. It is... Uh, Eminently practical, it's hard medicine, but I think it is medicine. Um, this is, uh, I, I liken every every bad medicine to taking Robitussin as a kid. I hated Robitussin. Um, it was a strong, unnatural cherry flavor that was gross, but it also had that really sharp, alcoholy, medicine-y tang. And you put both those together and it made each of them worse. But I would refuse it, like I'd fight it. But the hard medicine was for my benefit. And my mom gave it to me, not because she wanted to make me feel worse or to torture me. She gave it to me to heal me. That the hard medicine helped take away my sickness and pain. And so that's James. It's hard medicine. And when we drink it, we might make a face because it, it, it tastes rough, but it's not for our hurt or our condemnation. Even the hard medicine is to make us well and to make us whole. So I hope not just a good, you know, stuff that we could have gotten out of this for these last few weeks, but I hope there's something in it that will allow us to conclude Lent in a manner um, that is humble but grateful and that we will be ready we'll be ready for a cross and we will be ready very very ready for an empty tomb okay thank you all right thank you very much thank you.